Bethany. And I'm Lauren. Welcome to the Healing Collective Podcast, where we explore the paradox of healing at the individual and the collective level. Join us as we invite guests to share their personal paths to freedom. Hi, everybody. Our guest today is Lauren's sister, Jackie, aka Jacqueline. And I want to give a little heads up. We do touch on some pretty heavy topics, um, specifically around um, sexual assault. And so I just want you to be aware of that coming into this chat. Um, But yeah, we get to talk about relational healing and how that happens in our constellation. And for a lot of us, our, our close family members are our constellation. So we pretty much rap about that the whole time. Yeah, I, I guess I just want to share some gratitude and appreciation for the way that this podcast continues to be a place where I hear my own voice reflected back to me. And this podcast today and being with my sister and being with Bethany um, was definitely that. Hey, Chicago team. Chicago team. <laughs> um. Jackie, hi, welcome to the podcast. And I probably the whole time I'm gonna call her Jackie and Lauren's gonna call her Jacqueline, and we will confuse the audience with <laughs> who we're talking about. It's the same person though. Um, hi, welcome. Thanks. I'm How are you feeling today? You I'm nervous? Yeah. Uh, are thing. you nervous, Lauren? Thank you. No, I'm not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so Jackie's Lauren's sister and my friend and um, was part of the uh, crew that was here for birthday antics um, several weeks ago in Boston in Beverly. Mm-hmm. We got to spend a bunch of time together. Um, and she's our guest for today because she's visiting Lauren in Chicago at the moment. And we wanted to grab the opportunity. Yeah, it's crazy because I really, I have been having visions of being on the podcast for the last two weeks, but I thought it was like five years from now when I would actually have something to say. I don't know, like I thought I'd be able to talk in five years. Mm. And then you both were, as soon as I got here, like, do you want to be on the podcast? I <laughs> cried. I was like, oh, now, sure. That's awesome. Well, I think you've got a lot to say. And I think you've got a real pointer. Um, like how you were like thinking about being on the podcast and then like almost immediately we're like, Hey, you should be on the podcast. Um, I experienced your pointer. Um, I've been wanting a sound bowl for so long. And there was this, there's this weird witchy store in Rockport that has sound bowls. And I was with Jackie in Rockport and I tried to go to the store and it was closed and we couldn't get into it. And I've been up and down Bearskin Neck and Rockport like 100 times. And she somehow was like, we should go in this store, which is a store I've never been in in my life. (laughs) And I was like, okay. And she went in the store. I followed her in. And then there was like, I swear to God, we were walking around the downstairs of this, of this, you know, little store in Rockport and Bearskin Neck. And then she was like, like out of nowhere, a stairway literally like appeared out of the wall. Like I didn't <laughs> see that there was an upstairs and the whole yeah, upstairs was a room full of these um, like antique handmade sound bowls. And um, I bought one that's like 150 years old. And um, and then I used it in, in a meaningful way almost immediately. And I was really happy that I had it. So I think you've got some real instinctual pointer kind of, yeah, I think you got a real sense of things. I trust your instincts. Yeah, I'm really trying to sit with that um, and really trust my own voice because I, re- I grew up in a situation where I was told often that what I was thinking or feeling was like a lie, <laughs> like, or like, that's just not true, or that's, that's not how it is, you know? Um, and we just did like a cleansing of Lauren's space, um, and Jay Ratio, who you guys had on the show, they, yeah. they like have a gift and really trust their gift. And 
pretty much everything that they were feeling, I thought it before they said it out loud. And it really was the first time that I was like, oh shit, maybe I do really have some crazy level of intuition. Yeah, we had a very powerful ritual at my house that was like borderline journey work yesterday. Can I hear about it? Is it podcast appropriate? Yeah, I want to give some context about Jacqueline and like our relationship. Yeah, sure. Um, so Jacqueline was born when I was 14 years old. She's um, my much younger sister. She's six one. She's my much taller sister. <laughs> um, and I was super into it. And then I went to college and just kind of like launched into my healing destruction journey. And she was, you know, the kid at home with mom and dad sharing some really, really difficult things. So um, I would say like, yeah, we've all been on a healing journey. Mm -hmm. Um, Both like parallel with our parents, but then also between each other and our relationship, like constantly just a lot of healing, a lot of, you know, baggage. Um, And then Jacqueline, I would say, you know, her initiations, is what you're 25. Mm-hmm. She's had a lot of initiations mm-hmm. in a really short amount of time of her life. And I think that's really interesting because it's it's almost like we both had like the same intensity of initiations, but mine was over 40 years and hers has been over 25. And we're kind of like starting to meet in this new place. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like, and this trip, I'm, um, you know, I, I feel like the people listening to podcasts are probably like, why is Lauren always in transition? Well, <laughs> we started this podcast the hardest year of my entire life, and it doesn't seem to be fully complete. Um, I don't fully feel on the other side of it. So I think people listening are hearing a lot of that. Um, but it was like the first time I was really available to be like, I need my sister here. I want my sister here. Um, I'm going to ask for what I want. And just seeing how, and this came up in the ritual yesterday, just like how much this this apartment in Chicago that I got when I um, basically, right after Taylor was born, is like a place, has been a place of survival and a place of doing it on my own and a place of like really giving myself away to lots of other people. Um, So yeah, that's kind of where we are. My sister came to help me like re put everything together. Um, You just mean like in your space, like basically you haven't been living in the space in Chicago. You've been kind of bumping around, you're in Florida, you're in Colorado, and now you're kind of back in your space and kind of getting it organized. straightened up right yeah and Heyman moved out and he he was living here by himself and so there's just a lot of like really interesting transitions happening so yeah yesterday um Lola and Jay came over and first we just kind of sat in a circle and set intentions or spoke to like what was coming up and what and and it was really I felt like what they held was like a really strong space because it felt like one of the first times that I'd really been in trust or like love consciousness like deeply and then trusting myself you know for that time that they were holding the circle and I just reflected so much on the destruction of this year and the rebuilding um what stands out to you about that first circle part Mm. I mean, I definitely noticed a shift in your energy field, like, immediately as we all, like, sat down. Um, It was just, it was interesting because, you know, I've been activating a lot of memories over the last month. And so a lot of memories came up for me around her space, Um, even as simple as uh, the windows. The first time I ever came here my parents were really nervous about people seeing into her apartment and 
taking her stuff. And so I was even scared to open the windows and this apartment's already like naturally dark. Like it doesn't have the best lighting, you know? And so then I just had the urge eventually like through the process to open all the windows and to let light in. And I thought that was just like one small thing that shifted the whole energy in the space. And then it was just really interesting to, we walked with her through every room and just kind of held space in each room and allowed her to um, bring forward any memories or emotions that came forward and the bathroom and was probably, I thought was bigger than the (laughs) bedroom. Like the bedroom stuff was big, but like I thought the bathroom was the most raw that you felt. Well, each room had always like a metaphor for a part of my body or a part of my consciousness in a lot of ways. Um, the bathroom just held so much sadness because I cried in that shower and that bathtub so many. I mean, I've lived here for 15 years over like, you know, the most um, transformative times of my life. You know, like I... I've looked in that mirror as a principal. I've looked in that mirror as like a single woman multiple times. I've looked in that mirror as an addict. I've looked in the mirror body shaming and hating my body. You know, like that mirror trying to take selfies to look cute, um, trying to be sexy. Like it just kind of like the bathroom was like this. Yeah, like it was like a whoosh. Um <clears throat> I actually had a really positive memory, like while you were falling, (laughs) I wanted to, but like there, the first time I ever really remember putting on like a full face of makeup was with you in that bathroom and we like took Mm -hmm. selfies together. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And like, there's good memories too, like Taylor brushing his teeth, learning to brush his teeth in that bathroom. You know, there was a big, um, a lot of emotion. Also, like, we didn't go all the way in Taylor's room, but just I stood out the door and I put my hand on the door and just, like, you know, saw his crib and mm. like, there's been so many iterations, like, and, and, you know, it's like, I just see life as such a metaphor of our consciousness, such an expression of our consciousness, and like his room has changed multiple times, different beds, different colors. Um, and this house, it's actually been completely overhauled two times, like had two new sets of floors. Was When I bought it, I was telling Jacqueline, it was the show unit. And I had no real sense of my own identity. I just, I didn't look at any other places. I went on a walk. And it, there was an open house and I came in here and I was like, I want to live there. And it had furniture in it. And then they wouldn't let me keep the furniture, which I tried. And then I just went to some furniture store and was like, that's fine. Like, you know how you buy the whole living room set or whatever. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then there was like water damage at some point And I really got the opportunity to pick out like my colors and the floor that I wanted and that was a really significant time of deconstruction um, and reconstruction, which is like a big theme right now. And then we went, you know, outdoor, like in my backyard was actually pretty meaningful because of how many times and how many cars and just all the memories of like walking in that door because that's the door we come in to. And then the bedroom, we definitely felt some like dark energy that we moved. Um, There's a couple art pieces that we took down. I read my intentions from my journey work over (laughs) her while she laid in the bed. I also burped a lot um, throughout the whole. I just burped. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, 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 just so you guys know, I just learned how to burp. (laughs) (laughs) I'll leave it up to you how much you want to, you want to chat about all that stuff, but yeah. um, Something comes up for me when you guys talk about it. Oh wait, Jackie, what were you going to say? Like you read your intentions. 
about oh, I just just reading my intentions and sitting with her yesterday, you know, kind of goes back to what she was saying, how our lives, even though I'm 25 and she's 40, like tend to always just match what's going on. And I'm in a big, I call it a reroute of integrity, a realigning integrity in my life. Um, and I feel like Lauren is being pushed to kind of do the same thing right now with this reconstruction. Like I view those as a very similar um, situations. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's been a theme for me this year as well, you know. So that's what. And so I thought, like in that moment when I when she was laying in her bed, you know, a lot of my most recent journey has been around healing my vagina in a very literal and metaphysical sense. Um, and I just felt like in that moment she also needed to do that. And I think there's a lot of times where our souls are just like figurating. Yeah. So. Yeah. I laid on the bed and did, they, um, we played the song, um, the sovereignty hymn by the Bingstons. And, um, I just felt like all the trust of like floating in the bayou, like that, you know, I just let myself feel that trust. Um, my closet was interesting. Cause that was kind of like the, my subconscious mind, like the part that's hidden, like the 12th house kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I could just feel how clear it was and how much I moved. And I really think that I know this year has been so much about, you know, these transits in my 12th house of hidden things and releasing all this intergenerational trauma that I've been, you know, focused on for so long. Mm -hmm. And then also like putting like protection over it so that I'm not absorbing new things into it. Um, And then the kitchen was a lot about my appliances. Like, I don't know. I can't remember we captured this on the podcast, but I had done, I guess it's been nine months ago, eight months ago, a ritual around um, igniting my sacral chakra. And the next day my oven caught on fire in my house. I think that this is on the podcast somewhere. Maybe it's in like the feral episode. I can't remember. So now I have all new appliances. I have new microwave and new dishwasher, new oven. And it, it kind of represents to me like, like I'm, I have like a fresh start in those areas or those parts of my body. Um, but yeah, it was just a really, it was mostly just, I mean, we were both emotionally exhausted after Mm -hmm. like it just the vibration that we held together. And there was this piece. So everyone that was here was like Jacqueline and Lola, they're eight with the seven wing and then Jay seven with the eight wing. And there was just something, (laughs) there was a theme about, um, you bring that note up that we made, like the ring of fire, like having people step through a ring of fire to be close to me. You said I can work this part with. Um, yeah um yeah just like it's like they represent like such clear yeses and nos and people who trust their knowing and their body and you know they even asked me like are you complete with him and are you da 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 and we just had this whole conversation about how much I'm still learning to trust my own voice Mm -hmm. and my own intuition and how like lost I can get with other people. And it's so easy. Like if Bethany asked me to coach her or Jacqueline, we coach her, my, I would naturally kind of fall into my voice, but in my own being, and especially when people are reflecting back to me, like this, you know, I, I mean, we use him as an example, like most people reflect back to me and even he reflects back to me to a certain extent, like something that doesn't match what I feel, what I, I'm knowing, these knowings that I have. And it's even very confusing to me. Yeah. I really, I really relate to this idea of finding my voice in the sense that you know, I even over COVID, I watched my whole wardrobe like switch because I, I got stuck in Alabama and I typically live in Manhattan for those who don't know my story. <laughs> um, I like watched my wardrobe become this like earthy Southern mom. 
like vibe and I typically like everything was like white and green and like light browns and all this kind of stuff and I typically wear like all black yeah all black. <laughs> like you know and have like a very rock edgy vibe and I've just seen how I have like unconsciously committed for the last few years to like micro dose giving up my voice mm-hmm. in like in multiple different ways, even in the way that I designed my house at first, like I came, my in-laws helped me move. And I feel like a lot of the things that I put up or the way that I like laid out the space was subconsciously for them and not for me. And, you know, we're talking about like how you have been creating spaces for other people and not for you. And I just really vibe with all that right now with what I'm going through. I'm like having a oh everything you guys are saying I'm feeling really almost opposite or something like first of all well first of all I wish that I flew out for this weekend and that I have (laughs) seven eight vibes but um but Lauren like you staying staying with this one place that you lived like through every iteration and like staying with, staying with, staying with and like staying with for all the heartbreak and the joy of all of that. I have owned five homes. <laughs> I'm 39. And I moved like so many times before that too, before I bought places. Um, and there is something like you were saying that. And I was like, I just leave. Like I just, and I've been here for like six and a half years coming on seven years, I think six and a half years or something. And late, only lately have I just been like settled, like, no, I'm going to stay here. And this house has been through a lot of iterations. Like I lived upstairs with my husband at the time and my kids. And then we lived downstairs in, in the apartment that's in the basement. And my friends lived up here, Liz and her family. And then they moved out and I moved back up with the boys, but not with Jesse, like Jesse moved out and there's been all these iterations, but I'm still like mixing it up all the time and doing different stuff. So there's some way that I was noticing, like, and I can see how I've even done that in relationships and stuff and like how you stick with the him and stuff so much until you're like, really like sure you've learned everything there is to learn and how I leave things sometimes <laughs> maybe prematurely I don't know maybe right on but time. this came up actually in the ritual and we talked about how everyone is an individual reflection of God of source consciousness mm-hmm. like getting to know itself as that mm-hmm. and and like and we're all like there's never been the like Lauren Henley with the consciousness of the lives that I've lived, you know what I mean? Like the equation of this combination, like of who I am has never existed before. Um, and likely will never exist again in this exact same way. It'll evolve to something else. Mm. And how I, I'm really, I'm get, at one thing I feel clear about is that the the experiment or the version of consciousness I am is how much can you change internally in your consciousness without having to change very much externally. Well, and I just how much it's a reflection, like what Jackie's saying. Like she's like she, it was reflecting back to her how much she was changing, how she was dressing, or how she was organizing her apartment, or whatever, and. Um, yeah, I'm guessing that they're linked, right? Well, yeah, I mean, like, I definitely, like, relate to you in the fact that I, you know, for a long time, I basically moved every six months to a different apartment. For some reason, I had to move, and um, I const- I was even moving environments, like, from the city to Birmingham to Atlanta to back to the city to back to Birmingham, you know, and, like, I just noticed how much I wasn't changing things on the inside like I was I was I could very easily change my outside I could chameleon to you know the environment that I was at but I think the reason I did it so quickly and so intensely was because I wanted to change the inside you know like I felt that there was a big shift that needed to happen kind of going into what we were saying how you and I have this ability to feel things like three years before they happen you know And I feel like I like felt like a big change was supposed to be happening inside me. 
So you're like, we must, I, maybe we move. Right. So maybe like, I'm supposed to move. So maybe I'm supposed to like do all these actions yeah. instead of just like sitting with it. And I think, you know, the COVID came in and ripped me out of my life and forced me to sit in it. And I asked, and I like moved into a home that was full right. of. You didn't have the same choices to leave. Right. Like, to cut and run. Like, right. Like, and I, and I ended up moving into a space that was actually like super chaotic, like very similar to what, what Lauren came into. Like, and I had to sit there and like slowly pull out all the chaos and organize all the chaos in this home. I'm just remembering you making that friggin' patio like in a day or whatever. It was like, oh yeah, it's like yeah, we like concreted a whole thing. All of, it, all of this goes to like these things of like how we do one thing is how we do everything. And two, like everything is us. Everything is us. Like you know, when Jacqueline moved in that house, like like for this woman has costumes upon costumes. Like wow. If I think about who Jacqueline is, what intergenerational trauma, and I had to pull out all the costumes, yeah, you had to pull all the costumes, just like she did. It was a room. I remember being on Zoom with you, an entire. Oh, she made room. that room, but there were costumes all over. That. I mean, this was like kind of like very intense level, like rooms filled with things that she had to dig through and dig through. But if we think about Jacqueline and everything that she's gone through in her life, like that house is actually to me. A representation. It is. It's a representation of of her consciousness. Um, and what we were talking about is how what I've learned about myself is that I'm constantly perceiving things very far for, in front of me, mm-hmm. and it creates a lot of pain for me mm-hmm. in the present moment. Like, for, and a, a small example is like I knew when it was time to leave Kip, I knew that there was a transition happening. But it was, I didn't leave for three years. And I don't think that I was supposed to leave any earlier. Like that transition actually moved at the speed of trust or the speed of life. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I felt it, I started to feel antsy and da, da, da. And I was telling Jacqueline, it's like, you know, the earth, like we don't just wake up and we're five inches taller and we don't just turn, wake up and it's like winter. You know, there's a transition. And even in that transition, you might have days where there's like a random snow or a 90 degree weather day as you're transitioning. And there's something about being available for the transitional part too. Mm -hmm. And not just like rushing to, you know, I think so many of us. Why we don't know things, why we insist that we don't know things because the discomfort of seeing the delta of like knowing where something's going and having to stay with like I, that's uncomfortable mm-hmm. for me mm-hmm. it's very uncomfortable and so it makes sense to me that we would talk ourselves out of our knowing or go away from our knowing sometimes because of that that the the, the delta between the way things are right now and the way you have a sense things are going to be yeah. and all of the pain of the transitions between those two, the imper I mean, that's impermanence. Like we know that it's not going to be this way. So people who are really tapped into their own knowing are constantly facing impermanence and having to let go. And it's really fucking uncomfortable. Well, I'm <clears throat> dealing with that right now because I have known that I was going to work on Broadway since the day I was born. Like it's always just been everything I've ever talked about is theater, Broadway, going to get there. And pretty soon after college, I started working on Broadway. You like, know? do you know I coach a Broadway producer? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and now I'm like, you know, I have a really decent job with a, as an assistant producer to a producer who's very large scale and has a lot of shows coming. And, but I can see that I'm supposed to leave, <laughs> like theater. Like um, during the pandemic, my husband and I did this meditation over our journey and like we saw each other in a house like filled with friends but there was like a yard there was you know it was not Manhattan it was like clear that it was not Manhattan and I also saw very clearly myself leading an organization or something like that so this has been in the back of my mind and like now I know that I feel like I'm supposed to leave one of the companies I work for but I also know that I'm not financially in a place where I can do that yet or 
it's just not exactly right yet, but it's like in my body that it's happening to me. Yeah. And it makes me uncomfortable. It could be like 10 years from now. Right. Like it It, really could could be so in, in all these little pieces. And then I also find that like when we sense that vision or that shift, when we get to it, it's never as what we thought. It's never exactly what we thought. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like a pull. It's a pull to a timeline mm-hmm. or to a direction that's probably like the highest, one of the highest possible outcomes. But well, I <clears throat> this is really up for me um, relationally. So my old friend, like my co-pilot, I would really judge him so much for like dating a girl that he knew he wasn't going to date for very long and that she probably wanted to date him long-term. And he was like, no, but I'll I'll date her right now. And then later, you know, we'll break up. And I was like, that's so unkind. That is so cruel. Like I would get really, really reactive. And I'm one of the people that he dated and broke up with, but like I would watch him do this. And I had so, so, so much judgment and of course, like couple, several years later, I can feel, first of all, I can see how I do this, even with like friendships and stuff. Like I can feel into the people that I think I'm going to be in the boat with for life or a really long time. And the people that are my living own. situations, like you've been breaking up with living, living situations, situations um, romantic situations. It's like sometimes some piece of knowing that isn't even here right now. It's not even like an actionable thing, but there's some piece of knowing of like, and then I like, maybe I'm not going to be with this person forever or I'll get some hit or, or particular feeling about that on a, on a given day. And then I'm like, is it terrible of me to still be in relationship with this person? If I don't think we're always going to be friends forever, or we're always going to be boyfriend, girlfriend, or we're not going to get married or, you know, or even a job. Like I feel really mixed about, I have like nine jobs. I won't quit any of my jobs. <laughs> like I won't leave them. So it's interesting. It's a little different from the houses. Maybe like Jackie, I'm trying to move rather than to make other changes or something, but like, uh, I'm starting to get a better sense of like that you can hold some knowing and, le- and be kind of open around that and, and be like, yeah, it kind of seems like this. And I don't really know when and stay with something and the ways in which maybe that is unfriendly and maybe the ways in which it's really friendly and appropriate. And it's just what's here in the present moment. That's a, that's a shit show that I'm navigating currently. Well, and if I'm like really honest with myself though, about the knowing, um, you know, there's a lot of ego involved around leaving theater because Mm -hmm. there's a big, uh, I don't want to say joke. There's just like this situation where, people in theater go to New York and they leave like, and then everybody says that they couldn't hack it. And, you know, my, a lot of people I went to college with are really like mean. They were bullies. They were like, just really not a good theater experience. And I feel the need to like, continue to stay working on Broadway. To 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 them. Them. Yeah. To like, to be a, a fuck you to them. And I was even talking to my friend Sierra about it, like, but it's just like, we're not happy. (laughs) Like with that experience, with the theater experience. And that's the real reason people leave Broadway because it is not what you think it is. Even in the sense that most people assume, oh, it's theater, then it's very like LGBTQ friendly and we really support black people and we're very inclusive and bodies and like all this kind of stuff. And that's just not true. It's a bunch of, old white men running theaters, bringing in giant investors who are also old white men and then putting on show white stories and casting the same look over and over and over again. And it's just this commercialized, um, it's, called, it's just like a train that won't stop, mm-hmm. you know? And they'll like put out a show every season that's like supposed to be like super forward thinking. And then that show will like sweep the Tonys because it like talked about something important, but it's like, nobody's really addressing the fact that the other 15 shows that are up are absolute bullshit. Mm-hmm. Or the way that women are treated. Like Jacqueline talks okay. a lot about like how. You want to talk about that. Well, I just like had um, multiple experiences and talked with a lot of people like, uh, you know, Scott Rudin, 
um, recently was in the news and he was a large Broadway producer for mistreating his employees. But it's a big situation of the way that women are treated in the theater experience, especially like I've just noticed with male designers, you know, I originally was in lighting design. And the reason I left was because one, there's not a lot of women who do lighting, but every man that was over me in lighting for every project I worked with treated me like I was dirt. Mm. Like I was the scum of the earth, every single one. And I got that experience when I moved into administration as well. Like it's, And I'm exhausted, too, of my business partner and I talk about the abuse of interns, too, in this industry. You know, um, a lot of large-scale people, I don't want to say just men, because, you know, there are women out there, too, that aren't great, um, will hire interns and pay them a Metro card, you know, to get around. And you work 10 to 6 every single day doing most of their nitty gritty work like you know I'm it's like you hire interns to do work for free and someone's making three hundred thousand dollars above you and they can't even open a pdf like it's just like we have an ongoing thing of me and Jackie having a lot of similarities (laughs) and like and we and like we didn't talk about enough content of our lives for a long time to to see all of them but Jackie I had the same thing. I worked in the music industry. It was exactly the same. I was the only woman on a tour. I was on the Good Charlotte tour. I will say which band. I was on the Good Charlotte tour. This is like when they were cool. Like in I think they're so cool. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I remember flying out at the airport. They were on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine when I went to go fly and meet up with the band. It was 12 weeks. It was all over the country. I was the only female. Uh, it was 35 people. I was the only female female on the tour and I was doing it for, I was doing it for per diem, which is basically like $35 a day mm-hmm. to get in. I was, I was 20 mm-hmm. and I worked 7am till 1am, six days in a row. And we would have one day off and they treated me like shit. Yeah. The tour manager for that band at that time, if I was like, we would have a whole room for catering. It was like fancy catering, beautiful food. And I'd be hungry. And I'd be like, can I go get lunch? And he would say, do 15 push-ups first. Yep. And I was like, so I was like, fuck you. And I just pretended I wasn't hungry. The arts are so fucked. No, 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 no. (laughs) This is capitalism. It was out of control. You no, know, for people that are listening that say like patriarchy, like like that we're against the white man or whatever it is, like no, we're talking about systems of oppression, systems and hierarchies that are built on the assumption that basically there should be slave labor for it to exist. Mm-hmm. Like our whole system is built on the assumption that the the lower part of society should do the majority of the work for the least amount of resources. Mm-hmm. And we can track that back to the beginning of our country. And that is called a, it's called systemization of oppression. Then when that's acceptable and culturally um, like the, the, for example, the person that asked you to do push-ups. Mm-hmm. has internalized the system and their benefits from it, understand the power that they have, probably all subconscious, like couldn't identify that that's true mm-hmm. and use their power. And someone probably did it to them. So it was like a cycle of like victimization to a certain extent. Like when we're talking about dismantling white supremacy culture, like those are the things that we're talking about dismantling because now it's just become like a grandfathered in, like, yeah. this is just how we do this. Yeah. I had a breakdown like a week ago. No, it was the week after my journey experience um, that I really was like, I got into this to, to change that. Like I, I, I chased <laughs> theater because I believed that I was, a person who could change that or support the growth of another direction. And now I am like, well, I will say that I just recently got a job that I highly respect, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But like, um, 
but like I still like I'm filing papers and like looking over contracts or researching investors and just like I'm playing into a system that already exists and I'm not changing anything. Right. That's and why and I lost like, my shit at myself. Well, the same thing happened with education. Like towards the end of being a principal, I'm like, the system has influenced me almost more than I've influenced the system. Yeah. And I've been in it for 14 years. And now my agency is like to circumvent the system or to create mm-hmm. new And I don't even want to say, I don't want to create new systems. I want to create new communities, like Mm -hmm. new vibrational, you know, Mm -hmm. frequencies that, that manifest from the ground up because the system itself is, while it is dismantling and things are happening in Mm -hmm. our, at the end of the day, like until, until there are really consequences because of whatever happens with like the Dow Jones or until there are consequences to the most wealthy people in our society, like the systems will not shift much. Do you know who the the person in the music industry who treated me the best was of everyone I worked for? A black man. Um, His name was Greg Jones. And I did like local production days for him around Boston. So like whatever big shows are in town, we would have like a full day of production or whatever. And I worked for him. I was like his right hand person. And there was um, that we did a lot of those like hippie jam band. It's so gross. I just couldn't even know the body odor at these shows, but like a lot of the hippie jam band stuff. And there was some day it was like Mo, Deep Banana Blackout and Parliament Funkadelic. Have I told you guys about this? Mm-mm. Um, and it was at the Orpheum Theater in Boston, which has in the backstage is small. It's it's really high. It's four levels, and like each level you go up is like a little bit more dark and not good lighting. And there's not even like a real floor on the top level. It's like a little weirder the higher up you go. It's like just more remote and less used. But since there were so many bands, all the floors are being used. And the first couple of bands went on, and then they got off, and they were like partying basically. And then at the, whoever was whoever went last wanted everyone to come out on stage and jam together giant jam session so they sent me to like all the rooms and all the floors of the backstage to knock on the doors to be like everyone come back down like they want everybody on the stage and I got up to the furthest one away so I went up like this so everyone was leaving so I was up on this fourth dark dirty disgusting floor um, far from anyone And it was the last room on that floor. And I knocked on the door and there was two of the guys in Parliament Funkadelic in there. And um, I opened the door and they had like a pile of cocaine on like a gross dingy table and they were wasted. They had been drinking like a lot. And I was just like, now I was, I think, I was like, I want to say I was 16. And I was like, so wide-eyed innocent, like, really naive and so I was like um they would like everyone to come to the stage and they were like come in here and I was like <clears throat> they're like we can't hear you come in here and I stepped in and one of them grabbed me and the other one shut the door and stood in front of it and this big dude um like shoved me up against the wall and like was moving to rape me and he like kissed my face and groped me and uh the other guys laughing and watching And um, if they hadn't been as intoxicated as they were, I'm sure that would have ended way worse for me than it did. I um, powered up into my full eight. First, I froze. And there was a lot of shit happening for several minutes that was really bad and uncomfortable for me. But like for the most part, over my clothes or on my face or something like that. But then I um, got grounded and like came powered up with my hand the like the base of my hand like this is a really powerful place in your body ladies I came all the way up and I broke his nose (laughs) I smashed his nose and he started to bleed and then I kneed him in the balls as hard as I could and ran um and came like went right to this guy Greg who he'd been taking care of me and keeping an eye on me and watching me for some time like giving me a lot of cool jobs and work and stuff for years and he could just see that I was shaking. Like I couldn't even really say what happened. And he, and he just immediately tuned into me and and put his arm around me. He did not have me leave his side until he could like get out of there. 
um, and like get me out of there. And then he like never let me work certain types of shows. He stopped letting me work any of the rap shows and all kinds of things like that. But I didn't even have to explain all the way. It's like he could read that something had happened on my body. He like attuned to me and was just like something happened in it. And he like kept me really safe until it was a little chaotic. It was the last hour of the night and all that kind of stuff. But he, that's like, I've had other similar experiences like that in the music industry. And that's the first time somebody like took care of me (laughs) Um, in a way. Like I was so overwhelmed coming out of it. I was very, very shaken. And he really, really nurtured and took care of me. But there's been so many white dudes that did not. They did the opposite of that. They like took advantage of me in all, in all the ways. That's why I retired from that industry at 22 years old. I stopped. I thought that was my career for my life. I got so much further than any of my friends and people like at such a young age. Um, And I even did a lot of work in the Christian music industry and it wasn't that much better. (laughs) It was like, well, we're, we're going to pay you nothing because it's a ministry. So I still, it was like, not to make an unfair comparison to slave labor, but it was like, yeah, you know, working for 20 hours a day at eight bucks an hour or seven bucks an hour or something like that. Yeah. That chicken. I mean, it was definitely, yeah, it was hard to hear that for you. Like I just, cause I can feel it. And I think I was just like, I mean, all my eight stuff of like, the world's not safe and you got to be strong to survive. I can see how many ways I've, and I wasn't, I haven't, I've never been fully like sexually assaulted. That is like on the edge of it. I mean, it was sexual and it was an assault. Can you pause for a minute. It's just moving too fast. And I just want Jacqueline to move this. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like we're doing that thing where we talk over the emotion. Mm-hmm. I think she's reflecting something in you that you may not be able to fully connect to. It seems like you, you tell yourself like it wasn't that big of a deal, but I imagine your nerve, like what I'm feeling and I'm feeling in her is what your nervous system experienced. Yeah. Like, I feel like I'm you, like I'm in my body. (laughs) Kind of like how you were being me. (laughs) Yeah. I had a similar, it's not as strong, uh, but. Well, I just think I easily connect to it because I have yeah. been, you know, assaulted in every form, <laughs> basically. And so I have a very big portal yeah. for that. You want to talk at all about like your initiations? In yeah, your- I don't mind. Um, well, what came up for me originally when you were talking was I just got like a clear memory of an interview and I'm sure this man would deny it, but like, I remember like my intuition being online and realizing that I had just been hired for a job because of my looks. Mm. And I didn't even think I was that pretty. Like I, you know, but I like knew that that's, and that feels very, like I feel the violation for the first time in that thought. Mm-hmm. That was also coming up for me over here. Okay, can I pause? I do want to say, like, Jacqueline connecting to her emotions around your, like, that feels new, too. It feels newer for you to, like, deeply connect. To someone else's. Even your own, to a certain extent. Yeah, well, I mean, and, like, I'll just kind of rewind so everybody can catch up. Um, (laughs) So, where to begin? Um... I'll just begin at my journey and then kind of work backwards. So recently I did some medicine work um, around healing my vagina because I've been actually having like a severe physical pain, like in my pelvis. And I saw all these doctors who kept telling me I was fine. And I was like bawling my eyes out. Like they would do ultrasounds and all this stuff. And they're like, Oh, you know, there's nothing wrong. And I'm like, okay, well I can't be intimate with my husband right now. Like I need, help and um so then I reached out to my two women here to ask for their support um and the journey ended up kind of like walking me through micro doses of how like my sexual center kind of coming online is what I 
like experienced it like every little thing that affected me down to like you know seeing my barbie without its clothes on for the first yeah. time or like you know all these things that we forget or the first time a man outside of my father hugged me and that like activated something in me you know um i lost my virginity in the well that's very much I believe that my awakening or healing journey began when I met my ex-girlfriend. Um, I think that she held a space for me sexually and emotionally in the most like safest and most joyful way possible. Mm-hmm. And I rejected it in every form. Like I was like a big fuck you to her for being so incredible really and um it pushed me on this journey though to or like realizing that I had an obsession with like feeling safe with the masculine kind of like we talked about this a little bit the other day like it was like I needed it to be a man regardless of the fact that I was sexually attracted to women as well like I needed it to be a man so then I moved to New York and I think I was just like so scared of the idea of sex because nobody had talked to me about it nobody talked to me about it and every time I asked like point you blank sex with men because you had sex with your girlfriend right so like to me I didn't compute you know she's like I sold my virginity because I've never had a penis inside right that was like something that I but I know that to not be true like I really believe that I safely gave my virginity to her now but um but like yeah my awakening with men like I would go up to my mom and I'd be like, so how do you do this? Like, how do you give head? How do you like do all these things? And my mom would just be like, <laughs> I can only imagine your things. Things. <laughs> like, things that would never ask my mom. Yeah. Like I, because I didn't, I didn't know who else to ask. And I knew that she created me. So I thought she'd tell me and she did not And so I was so nervous. I remember I went on a Tinder date. This guy was six, eight. I had never been with a guy who was taller than me, like that much taller than me. And for tall women out there, that's like a big freaking deal because it's the first time that you feel feminine and like held. And I'm like, I literally held by a man because he is like encasing you versus every other guy I've been with is like slightly shorter than me or like super skinny, you know, all this kind of stuff. So he was the first person that I felt like, you know, with, And I was so excited by that, that I like went into the basement of this bar with him and just like gave him my virginity in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then I continued to like, I let him in my dorm room. This is like a 30 year old six, eight man. And I'm 18. And like, he came to my dorm room and like had sex with me and like did all this stuff and he didn't even think twice about it. And now I, and every single time I had to be drunk. And then this like led to a path of getting wasted every single night and sleeping with multiple people and just like putting it out there because one, it was how I knew that I was attractive mm-hmm. because people wanted to sleep with me. Like, that's what I told myself, like, oh, you're attractive because people want to have sex with you. Mm-hmm. But then it also was like, I just wanted, I wanted to feel safe in the most, and I, it's so fucked up to say that that's where I searched for safety was in like a very unsafe scenario. And I realized now, like looking back, like I can't, I was blackout drunk every single time I had sex. Right. And that was really confusing for me for a long time because some people started to tell me that that was assault. Mm. Right. But like, I knew that I was going out at night to have sex. Mm -hmm. Like I, like I knew that I was going to wake up in someone else's bed in the morning, but I never remembered it. Mm. And so then in my system, it became like this, like, so was I assaulted? Was I like taken advantage of, or was I like in my own power? It was like this, like crazy zigzag but I will say it was I felt powerful I felt the most powerful I've ever felt 
in that like circumstance. And, um, it got to the point where I was so numb Mm. to my body. Like I remember Lauren calling me and I was in the bathtub and I was telling her about, I had become a sugar baby at this point. And she was so mad at me. Like, I mean, she was mad and Lauren didn't really get mad at me that often. Um, but this was like next level mad. And I felt nothing Mm. towards what she said. Like, I was like, "Mm mm-hmm. Mm. Well, I was okay. scared shitless and then like from there then I want to I mean it feels like I'm sure it wasn't like this but it feels like the next time we talked was when she, you called me about Greece it was very, like in my mind it was all like this going off you know just getting more and more severe so do you want to tell yeah Greece? so um I went to um Greece for a school trip in college I was directing a show at like the festival of Dionysus. Um, It was the most like beautiful, like main character movie shit, you know, (laughs) that you would see. And I was like flirting with Greek men and I, you know, they love a tall blonde over there. Like, you know, it's like, I was having a great old time. And then I remember going out with my friends And the bartender was really cute. And I was like flirting with the bartender. And I even thought to myself, like, I'm, you know, probably going to have sex with this guy. Like, that's probably going to be a thing that happens. But then, like, I just remember getting drunker and drunker and getting really, really confused. And I even kind of remember my friend, like, trying to get me to leave and me being like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And, um, And then all of a sudden, I, like, couldn't move my body and thank you were paralyzed yeah and um I was like laying down and the bartender and his friend and like a a couple of his friends um proceeded to gang rape me um in the bar in the bar and and then I found out um later so I tried to get help in Greece and they like well, they left you on the sidewalk. Yeah. They left me on the sidewalk and told me they were done. And I called, I finally got to where I could move and I called my friend crying, asking for help. And then I remember a bunch of people surrounding me and being like, oh my God, her eyes are going in different directions. Like she's like shaking, she looks terrible, and people like having to hold me up. Like I like was so confused. And my school took me to a doctor, like they were very supportive, but in Greece, like they would not help me for what happened to me. They wouldn't do a rape kit. Yeah, they wouldn't do a rape kit of any kind. And then crazy in a crazy world, my parents happened to be in Germany instead of America. Like there was all this stuff. Like we called Lauren to see if by the time I flew to America, like I would the rape kit wouldn't be um like invalidated. Like that would be invalidated. And so like I my school flew me to Germany, um, where I got to see some really great doctors and they did the rape test and prove that to my, you know, parents, but then they also like tested my bloodstream and found out that I had a paralytic, like in my bloodstream. Um, and I remember this hospital, like in Germany was like all stark white. Like, I mean, like whiter than white, like very futuristic. Like the chair was scary. It was like, you know, like it was like what you see in the films and, um, And it was, and then that night after I got to my parents' hotel, I sat in the shower for the whole night with cold water rushing on me and I didn't move. Like I was like frozen. I was stuck in freeze. Yeah. Like from still, I think the paralytic in my system and just like the shock of what had happened. Yeah. And the cold water was just like pouring down on me. And now like I have a thing about water making me calm, I think because of that, um, and how many situation. years ago was that now? It's, it's, um, that was in 2017 when that happened. Um, and it was also really sad because my dad, like, if anything, like, he's, like, the, <laughs> like, the one thing he was, like, good at, I think, would be, like, like, he would kill somebody, you know, like, for doing it like this, you know, and he was so sick at that time. Yeah. And all he could do was hug me, and I could feel, like, 
like it hit him like how much he wanted to help and he couldn't yeah. and honestly that is the most profound thing that I remember from the whole experience and my mom's two best friends happen to be on this trip and they're like very dear to my heart aunts and they all just like sat with me and we cried and we just like talked about everything and I remember pretty quickly after like coming online like it was like the first time that I was like oh my god I've been assaulted like all this time oh my god like I've been making all these choices to just give my body to so many people and it like saved me in the most fucked up sense like I don't think I deserved it in any way I don't justify what happened to me but it saved my fucking life (laughs) to go through that because it woke me up yeah um and then pretty shortly after that I met um by shortly I mean like basically a year later so well so I ended up transferring schools I left New York I like shut it all down and I like ran away to the south because I thought I'd be safer there and then ended up getting assaulted two more like drunk two more times in that experience um and then the next summer I met Jeremy and it was the first time that all of my darkness was like let out like we just like were able to hold space for each other's most darkest evilest parts to the point where it was almost like addicting that like basically what I'm saying is like I went through all of this stuff And then it was like unleashed, like all that dark energy that I had been holding in my body from all these experiences. Um, Like that he uh, could hold it all or that he didn't judge it all or like what? Yeah, it was just like accepted. Like, you know, like all mirrored. It was mirrored too. Like they had a lot of um, dark shit also. And um And I just remember, like, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. it was just like, it was crazy. It was, um, it was so profound also in the most fucked up way, you know, and I'm so so intense. I mean, there's so much intensity and I imagine like even your own system, something about that whole period where you were like going out a lot and do it. It's like, I mean, there is a way where intensity feels good when you've had a lot of trauma in your body. Like the charge is so high all the time anyways, but there's something that feels like when things are really intense, it feels like it matches. It almost feels like alignment because there's such an intense nature to it. I imagine that's why are you, why some, where some of that powerful feeling came early on. And then your relationship to feeling powerful there got Mm -hmm taken away and coupled with being completely inert and frozen. Like you actually were given a, like a paralytic that shut your body down and all this stuff in the nurse, it all came together. And so I'm guessing that there's something like, yeah, for someone to be able to hold all that intensity and the confusion around all of it and how mixed it all is in your system and all of that was probably a really important Well, and I thought it was, I'm like nervous to say this, but like, I, I thought that was love. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that meeting each other at that level of intensity and being able to hold space for each other at that level of intensity and like being able to like unearth all that dark, dark shit and just like sit with each other and be dark. Like I saw that as like the biggest love that anyone has ever had for me, well, you know, they were accepting you, which yeah, is right. at that point in your life. That probably was true. Right. Yeah, that might've been true at that point. Yeah. <laughs> like from that place and your healing and in your consciousness, just having someone not experience all that as like broken and not okay. And, and want to be with you and experience those things and be in that with you that I can see how that 
that is a form of love. Acceptance is a form of love. Yeah. And I really like, but then if I think about it, I was like giving them my body also in the same way. Like I was like giving them my darkness. I was just like, here, here's my stuff. Like to everybody I was with, I was like, here's my stuff. Here it is. Well, can I just side note this? Yeah. Like, again, I'm not the authority on anything. (laughs) And like, this is what I'm seeing. I'm pointing to it in the conscious races. I'm pointing to it in my own life is that like, love is a vibrational frequency that's always available we meet that frequency at the place that we are available for it. And what it does, it, it, it is the medicine. Whatever is not love, whatever's not in right relationship with love gets unearthed. Mm-hmm. And that, and the game or, or like the way that we work through what we cannot see in ourselves is through relationship. That is the gift of having a mirror, right? Yeah. And that mirror helps us see ourselves in a way that we can integrate. And that starts as usually codependency. Right. We meet where we're trying to move to interdependence as like maybe the highest, like most where two free people are, are you know, mm-hmm. like consciously choosing to be interdependent. But it is a process that we have to meet wherever we are. Um. And I just see so much in our culture where it's like, it would be so easy. It's not to say that there wasn't like toxic things that happened or that it wasn't whatever, you know, it's not something you want to continue for the rest of your life. But also, like I would say, like you weren't available for anything else. And that relationship allowed you to move through all of it. Yeah. And, and both of you to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like so grateful for that experience because it, I think it required me in the first, for the first time to, to face all the unconscious, like darkness again, that like I had been like pushing through my whole life, like by giving my body to other people, by like doing all this, like it like required me to just like sit in it, you know, and to be like held in it and to just like be seen as dark like I just remember being so grateful to not have to hide anything to just be like fully seen you know um so I'm really grateful for that experience but then that relationship ended and I met the most (laughs) like innocent and peaceful and kindest person in the entire world they married now (laughs) (laughs) it's a happy ending folks it's a happy ending and um but like I wasn't even ready for it when I met them you know like if you would have told me my little sister was going to be the first one married in our family I knew it wasn't going to be me (laughs) but I actually used to joke as a kid that I was going to be the first one to get married like and this is me like but knowing no. this history you're sharing right you're yeah. you're not thinking that leads to like <laughs> happy ever after but it really kind of did and i i see it as such grace like i see it as grace like to go through so much in such a like i mean really and we could backtrack like Jacqueline my dad was 64 Jacqueline was 61 i don't know how old you were middle school like my dad jumped in the bayou like out of his mind she pulls him out like she was home when he was deteriorating his mental illness his well, I was home when he was aware that he was deteriorating like that was the chunk that I was home for my brother was home for the actual like deterioration process but like I was, was nowhere to be found I was there for the time of like please kill me because I'd rather die right now than like slowly like lose my consciousness yeah and just basically like and my mom when I was with her this summer was like talking about that time and all these things that they were going through because my mom's parents both had cancer during that time my mom's brother committed suicide my dad's brother committed suicide I mean it was an intense intense time my dad lost his dad Uh, the life that's a life of intensity and a life life of intensity and that's why like i 
to go back to like the relationship with Jeremy, it was like the first time that all of that was just like seen and just like held. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all the intensity was just like held. And I was even aware that it was being held, but, um, but like, because it was able to be held, like then when I met Ben, like I was able to like see what breathing felt like, like what, just like pure relaxation safety. and safety. What I what actual safety felt like, you know, because the I thought system knew he was safe enough that you could relax all your vigilance. It's like this safety that I've been chasing in men over and over again by having sex with them. I found in this man. And I even like, you know, met him while I was still dating Jeremy. And I um I remember like sitting in my dorm room senior year and I'm like my second senior year because I uh, go through two. Um, I was like scrolling through his Instagram because I just got like a urge to look at it. And I remember like hearing this voice now that I know like that I call spirit or universe or knowing. And I remember like it saying like, that's going to be your husband. And I like laughed in my bed and I was like, that's a weird thought. And I like, just like, <laughs> like shoved it away. We weren't dating. We weren't like anything. He was just my employee at the time, you know? Um, but all that to be said, my, the journey of healing my vagina of like sitting in what the divine feminine is like has been happening since I feel like the day that I was born um and it took me being in the safest most light-filled relationship for me to actually heal like I used to like you know really get off on like learning lessons with people and like even Jeremy or Holly like I really just like or Jonathan, like I loved like digging in that dark shit, unearthing it and just like moving through it together. But like, it took having a husband that just sits there, <laughs> you know? And it's like, he's the oak tree. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. he's so rooted mm-hmm. for me to finally be free enough to heal my vagina and to heal the emotional trauma and pain that lived inside of it down to like being screamed at by my dad you know like that's in there Mm -hmm. or being screamed at by men at work Mm -hmm. or um being told that like my only priority in life was to get married or Mm -hmm. having my mom force guys on me to date even when I told her that they were mean to me you Mm -hmm. know like it like was all it just like all correlated and I feel like it just got like locked in my vagina and my vagina just like kept holding this thing like you're not you're not listening to me you're not choosing me you're not you're just a a giving others this power to decide who you are how you're going to eat all this stuff and like even realigning my vagina I think like comes with this whole sitting in integrity situation that I've had because on like on top of that kind of with my mom and my body image issues, you know, I was, have been on diet since fifth grade because I was six, one, I was like, I was already so tall. So like having any weight on me, I just like felt like a wildebeest. Mm-hmm. Like that's like my word. Like I felt like a wildebeest around people mm-hmm. just because I was six, one in middle school, like in eighth grade and everybody else is like this big and like tiny, you know? Um, and it, it, it honestly like forced me to feel masculine too like I feel like like being bigger being like all this stuff like the masculine energy just like kind of sat in me more naturally yeah and I think I even like unconsciously rejected the feminine in that like scenario of being so much larger than people and so I dieted since fifth grade I've like obsessed with my weight and my when I got married, the year I got married, I lost 70 pounds in a nine months. Like I like starved myself and I like have gone through this whole thing. Like where one year I'll lose a ton of weight. The next year I'll gain it back. I'll lose, I'll gain, I'll lose, I'll gain. 
And since January, like I'm on my first um, time, like I'm nine months into not dieting. I'm eating whatever I want when I want. My goal is to kind of make it beautiful though. Like any food that I eat, like it has to be beautiful to my eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like have always been nervous about being too much. And I had a friend say, you know, rock stars choose to be too much. And my favorite music is rock music. And the way I actually dress is very rock and roll. And like when he said that, it also triggered, triggered this line of integrity of like, that's how I want to dress. I want to dress like a fucking rock star. I want to be too much. I want to wear a black lipstick and I want to like get in your face and like make you uncomfortable, like with my energy field. And I want to be noticed. I want to be seen. I want to be like, you know, I want people when they walk, when I walk down the thing to be like, who's that girl, (laughs) you know? And then like with my home, like I have blue pillows and I just remember, cause they came with the couch, kind of like how you were saying, like, I just, I just bought the couch. Like they just came with the couch and I was like, cool. Yeah. That's an adult couch. I'll keep that. And like I, in the last month rerouted my house and like, everything's black mm-hmm. and like, it's very witchy. <laughs> and like my husband's totally on board, which I just think is great. <laughs> um, and I like joke with my friends. I'm like, this is re- year round. This is not for Halloween. Just so everyone knows, but like, I've just like pulled out each line of integrity, like through, but I think it came like through my vagina portal, like through the divine feminine portal, I'm able to be like, okay, that's the integrity of how I want to dress. That's the integrity of how I want my home. That's the integrity of how I'm going to eat now, or this is how I want my marriage to look. Or I've even like realigned integrity with my friendships. You know, I recently ended one that has been really fundamental in my life for a really long time, because I I actually was listening to you guys talk about how important it is to surround yourself with people who like really like when you give feedback or when you're talking, like really see it, really sit with it, support it. It's like a mutual like circle of that. And I realized realized that this person is not in integrity with how I want to live. Like they, they really want a life of like, sugar cookies and rainbows Mm -hmm. and I don't want that life I want to like talk about it Mm -hmm. I want to like get into it I don't want to deny that it's there you Mm -hmm. know and so then that was me like pulling out another line of integrity through my vagina like it was like I just like feel like these like strings (laughs) kind of like Mariko was talking about like I feel like these strings coming out of my vagina of like different how is your pain now um I am great (laughs) yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy. I even my turn on is even like larger and I like I'm even allowing myself to say out loud like more things that turn me on. Like it turns me on to go to the grocery store like when it's like an organic like there's like vegetables everywhere like a farmers market turns me on, man. It really does. Or like I don't know like going and swimming in a pool totally turns me on. But also like you know my husband hugging me turns me on this is just the last month this is just the last month my life has just been like we also we read the pussy book yes highly recommend the pussy book i have like 25 friends reading it right now so life-changing um what i want i wanted to just say something quick about integrity because i know we've talked about it a little bit but like in the frame that jack was talking about it she's not talking about like morality or that kind of old definition of doing the right thing when no one's looking it's about like what's an integrity with her energy field? Like where, what is the highest truth as Jacqueline? Um, And she really challenged me when we were looking, this is why I had the panic attack. So basically Jacqueline came, we cleaned and purged almost everything. It feels much better, but I'm also like, I'm at this edge of like, we we were going to repaint. We're going to do all this stuff. And Jacqueline's like, when we go, if it isn't like a full yes for you, I feel like don't do it, you know? And I just, I hit a wall of like all these, there were no full body. There were no full body yeses. And like, I know that what I want is like, like I want like really nice items, 
Like I, for what we have in our budget, I could probably get one thing, two <laughs> things. I know that Jacqueline could get like 25 things with that amount of money. And I could not, I, but there was this anxiety of like scarcity. Like I just saw all these reasons why I don't necessarily like hold out for the like best thing, the thing that I most want. And then there was this other edge of like, do I want to keep investing in this particular place that I'm living now? Do I really want to make this place better? Or am I, is something going to arrive? Like, is there another place? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, something you said, I'm like, we were talking about like aligning it integrity. Oh, getting like an integrity, sense. right. So like, for me, like Jacqueline was like holding me also to, what is in my highest integrity. And you know, you know how Diana does that exercise when she walks around her house and it's like just every single thing in your house turn you on. And she's right. really committed to having like the very best of everything, you know? Um, and so I'm just reflecting on in my own integrity, like how I can't, I can't figure out how to make it all work. You know, it's like, if I'm in, like, I don't fully believe that I'm going to have what I need to access the things that and experiences that are most in integrity for me. It's something mm -hmm. like that that's coming up. Yeah. And then, well, I just want to say the last thing. So, but this car situation, there's been a couple of times where like getting a car has been like a metaphor. I feel like that the universe has given me. So like my last car was or a couple of cars ago was hot pink and black. <laughs> And I, I totaled my car unexpectedly. Like, <laughs> right. I never, I like go to the car. Lauren's and like, whole apartment is like hot pink and black. Yeah. Well, during that <laughs> period of my life, everything was hot pink and black. And like, I'm looking for cars, looking for cars. I don't know what I'm going to do. And like, I walk up and it's like, it is as if someone made a custom car just for me and my <laughs> wants. Um, and then I remember like at the beginning of CLG, one of the first things they used to call me Mercedes as a joke. And the reason was because in one of our first forums, I talked about how I feel like the way I see myself and the way that I'm treated by men is like I'm a Chrysler or a Buick, <laughs> like, and that I'm not a Mercedes. Like I don't see myself as a Mercedes. I'm not treated as a Mercedes like that. And so recently, you know, like I really needed a car. I didn't know how it was going to work out. And all these synchronicities came together. I definitely thought there's no way I can have a nice car because I already have a car note for this other car, blah, 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 blah. And like it ended up like a, a, a Lexus in like pristine, a red Lexus. Red. Is what like a car is red. I'm excited. It's a bright red car. Like I was standing at the airport. I was like, hey, what color is your new car? And she's like red. And but I was say like, why oh. that's significant. It's just because I don't. Well, one, it's significant because we were talking about how this new journey is like a ring of fire for her. And like and the root chakra. And the red. root chakra is red. But like, red has never been a color. Never. Like she's always like, it's pink. What's or the purple, what's the purple, purple, or like, for shock for shape? <laughs> for your chakras which is red what's what's the color what's the root chakra your oh, that's root vagina your pussy just <laughs> <laughs> um, also has a pussy car it's yeah, a pussy <laughs> car. it has leather it has like a, a a sky roof and it's like the exact car payment that i could like i wanted yeah and so there's just like something for me about like I was telling them that I feel like I'm shifting to some new level of the game, the game of life, the video game of life, where it's like, you don't get to say anymore. <laughs> you don't get to control it. You don't get to say it. What you need is going to arrive. And it may not always be what you want. Yeah. Um, and what you, and there's, but there's still something like, and this is my edge. It's like, and it's still, it's going to be even better than what you wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's the part I'm not like fully trusting. Uh, you're, yeah. I, I'm in that same thing. I, there's like a lot of areas of life where the, I've made that shift. Like there was a period where I was really trying to build my coaching practice. And I was like, 
working real hard at like a website and building. And then now it's just like rolling in. I don't try at all. And it's so much better than I thought I was going to be. It's not what I imagined. And there's other areas of life that are like that. And then there's a couple holdout areas where I am not orienting myself like that. And I know that that's my path. I know it's just like, just let it come in, trust it, let it come in and know that it's going to be great. Stop trying to make stuff happen. Yeah. And I really struggle with that. Like, like even like we were shopping yesterday and it was so challenging for me to not like if if this was my apartment the entire thing would be painted and decorated and done yesterday like and I would have shop and when she's shopping she's like I want this I want this I'm like yes that. no yes no yes no like very and quickly. this is how this is how it looked I wish we had the paint colors this is like <laughs> okay, let me just feel this. Like, <laughs> oh no, no, like I can't. No. Like we were just walking <laughs> everywhere and Lauren was just like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would get overwhelmed. There's too many choices. Yeah. Like, I don't even know. Like, like I hadn't even done like a vision board. I don't even feel like a hundred percent committed to redoing this place. So then it's like, there's a part of me that just wanted to be like, do whatever you want. But then that's an old pattern, right? right. And like, I was not willing I'm to participate. Like, I was right. not willing. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, the other side of it was like, it kept bringing me back to myself. And then I'm like, am I really supposed to be painting my place? Am yeah. I really? You like know, if what? you're this unclear, like if you are right. this unclear. Well, you actually are the one that like really, that like triggered me to say this to her because like you, everything you purchase in your home was so so intentional important to you like so intentional and so like I was telling her and kind of even telling myself like if there is a couch you want and you cannot afford it right now and that is really the couch you want then you gotta wait yeah till you can afford that couch yeah. you know or like and that's something that I, I just I really struggle with and I think has to go like kind of to full circle this goes back to like Broadway and like where I'm working right now like I'm like Patience is not my strong suit. It has never been my strong suit. I'm like, I am an action girl, which I actually think is a superpower that I do have to have to be so like, get it done, like problem solve, like handle it. But like, I just watch, like it was the first time watching her shop and knowing like, this is not my space. Mm -hmm. And my commitment to coming here is to fully support Lauren. Mm -hmm. and And I know that in supporting Lauren, that means not allowing her to allow anything into her energy field that is not a full body guest. Mm. And like, if that is really what I'm here to do, then like, we're just going to walk around. For multiple it hours. For multiple like, hours. Home with a trash can and, <laughs> and some rags. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say the ritual. Well, how's it feel? How's it feel to have your sister stand for you like that a whole space for you like that yeah I mean it's a huge gift like I I've always felt like a little piece of my soul is over there um I don't know how else to explain that but it's almost like and even yesterday with having all those eights like I was saying how our dad we think our dad was an eight that functioned as a really unhealthy five for most of his life. And I attuned more to his very unhealthy five. Mm -hmm. Like I really picked up on that energetically. Like I don't see it's even really energetically picked up on his eight. Right. And it's even hard for me to see him as an eight because I didn't experience him as powerful. I experienced him as weak and afraid and scared, but that's my orientation. Right. I, I often pick up on people's kind of shadow um, and how, like, I, I feel like an invitation for me, like that, the high side of the eight is the invitation. Can I say something real quick? I feel like you see the shadow and I see people at their highest self. Mm-hmm. Like you're able to like see that. And then I'm able to see up here, which is why we have that like issue. Well, the, like, I mean, the other thing is though, I see the highest self too, because that's what gets me in trouble. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, right? Like in the Haman situation, it's like, I keep holding this, like, I keep holding out for this, like higher part while I feel the shadow at the same time. So I, that's its own podcast, but, (laughs) um, yeah, 
Um, yeah, I just like, and, and even Shana models this for me in such a beautiful way. Like, I feel like life is surrounding me with people who trust their body and their knowing unconditionally. Like Shana, if she feels something in her body, it does not even matter what her mind, how her mind, she's just like, my body is so consistently right mm-hmm. that like yeah. I'm following that no matter what, or like her knowing about people mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. and other people can have their own experience, but it doesn't change yeah. her experience. And what I was telling Jacqueline is one of my superpowers is I can hold space for so many perspectives. Yeah. I can see, I can empathize with almost anyone. I can find the way that their experience is true and feel it as true. Mm. So I, then I get lost. Like what is true? Like I I'll even be like, how can you know that is so true? Because I can, there's like a hundred other possibilities. And that's when, that's when I fall apart though, is when someone asks me how I know. Like literally, like Ben, my it's like a fight that we have. Like he asked me to explain, like how I know, or like a friend that I broke up with. She asked me to explain how I know that something's not gonna be right, mm-hmm. and I can't. Like I lit, I, I cannot put words on it. Like I cannot tell you. I just like every thing in my body is just like that's how it is. And then <laughs> there's this piece of like the part that really fucks with me that I'm moving through now is. There's so many things that I would say, if you really ask me, what do you know? What do you know? <laughs> like the reality of what's happening doesn't match mm-hmm. what I know. And often so much of what I know is what's unseen to so many others. Mm-hmm. You know, like a small example is like this shadow part. Like, I don't know how many times I I can feel like people's darkest stuff that's like in a basement and it is blind to them. Like they can't see it. And so for so long, I just thought, well, I'm making it up. Yeah. Something's wrong with what I'm feeling in them. Um, And so much of what I sense is like, it's outside of this dimension. It's almost like a metaphor would be like, like everyone's watching a movie Mm -hmm. and I see the projector. Yeah. And I'm focused on what's in the projector and what are the little film strips? Like, and I can feel like, that's where my attention and my awareness is. And then I'm watching the movie and I'm like, this doesn't match. match. Yeah. And then everyone else is watching the movie and they're like, Lauren, look at the fucking movie. Why do you keep, hurting yourself why do you keep moving in this direction why do you keep doing this like do you see what's happening in the movie yeah and I'm just like in this constant state of self gaslighting yeah I I feel that coming online right now like kind of like I was talking about with Jay like I feel like a lot like I have gaslighted myself a lot and that kind of came with me breaking up with this one friend because like I I with her I it was like that one time that I could see both like I was looking at the film strips and I and she would just like not hear me or she would put me down or make me and I would second guess myself for like having these emotions and I gaslit myself completely and I have been for a really long time and that's why I'm trying to even with you and like with Ford like or like as a kid I wrote these Christmas letters to everybody like telling them basically before CLG was like I'm gonna give you a bunch of feedback. Like I gave, Santa Claus. That was my I like <laughs> signed it at Santa Claus and I gave everyone feedback on like the dark, the dark shit that I could see going on in their lives that they needed to deal with. So and I gave it to Diana. Christmas. Diana said exactly that on her podcast. Yeah, like said. that's what I did as a kid. And everyone froze and like looked at me like I was crazy for seeing that. And that was like the first time I gaslit my intuition. Yeah. And then, like, so, like, I totally, like, I just, like, I'm online with what you're saying. Like, I feel. Ooh, often, like, when I process this stuff out loud, the universe starts to give me, like, insights and and reminders. And the reminder I just got was when I was at Kip, I was 
I saw a vision of possibility and I was, I was very far away from self-trust. Right. Mm -hmm. But every, it just, something was like, this feels wrong. Like it feels like we're going in the wrong direction. I would, it manifested as me being kind of like counter-cultural, like pushing back a lot or kind of like undermining, sabotaging a little bit because, um, and then when I, when I started to leave Kip, I wrote this proposal for everything that I thought would like be really supportive to where they were going as an organization. And it wasn't, it wasn't received that way. Well, yeah, multiple levels. Like, you know, one, they didn't see me as the person to execute that. I had it, I didn't have, you know, there's just all these like levels. Yeah. But now that's the work. Well, one, George Floyd happened. And now people, that exact proposal is what we're doing in all of these different places. And it's what people are seeking out. And like, I can see that like what I was seeing. Uh was true. It just wasn't true in that moment yet. Like it wasn't, it wasn't true. It was, it was true. And, and I can still see it was what was needed. Mm -hmm. And there, but there's also this dance of like Lauren being fully in, in her own power. Like I also wasn't the being to execute the vision that I saw. Yeah. And there's multiple things like well, that. That's hard. That that so I just I just am in such a state of like humility with the universe. Like, and I keep having to remind myself that even though it feels sometimes like I'm backtracking, like in a lot of ways, like I know I'm not. Like I think I'm wise. I think that I'm I'm gaining like a level of wisdom with how things work for me. And how, and something about me is like, yes, there's a lot of things individual for me, but I'm very connected to collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. Other people are very connected to individual consciousness. So I'm constantly connected to like how things are working for everyone. And um, like right now, yeah, like I just feel like, like when I came home to my house and it was like chaos, it was like sit in the chaos look at what your house has become. Look at how this person you love has treated your space mm. because that's the way that, and this person is, you. Really, what? That's how he treats you. Yeah. yeah. And he's completely unconscious to it and would say that that's that. And in a lot of ways, he probably does treat me the best of anyone in his life at the same time. Like that's also true. Yeah. I actually probably have gotten some of like, the best yeah and just like this the universe the old me would be like more like kind of like your energy like I gotta take care of this I gotta do the next thing yeah uh, what's the right answer I'm gonna manifest I'm gonna vision board I'm gonna whatever and like the humility now is like I'm gonna just be in the next moment mm -hmm. and that's all I really know yeah that, that's what's available and I think that's the same thing that I'm having this year is like, like sitting in my knowing, right? Like being integrity with my knowing what I know over here, but then also just being available for everything I don't know to be okay that I don't know, mm. you know, like, yeah. cause we, yeah, like, <laughs> it's like, it's like a duality. It's like knowing. trust your knowing, but also be okay. Not knowing when knowing isn't here yet, when yeah. knowing isn't here yet. And, and when you know that like, you're supposed to know, like, that's what I was like telling Lauren last night in the car. I was like, do you know, the most annoying thing about consciousness is being conscious. <laughs> it's like it is, it's like, like having an awareness and like knowing things are coming or knowing how, like, you know, this is for the greater, this healing, blah, blah, blah. Like, knowing that but then also having to stay is in like current, in right? the current is just like it's a it's a mind fuck it's a mind fuck and a soul fuck like all in one well the other piece is um something just came up around like when I feel into Haman like that who I like if, if I if I'm my full trust is online then what would be true is who I know him to be as his highest self. And what I'm sensing is the truest version of who he is, but being present and grieving his path and not knowing mm -hmm. what he'll choose along that path mm -hmm. and not knowing if this opportunity that I see 
for us in our fullness is what is is what's going to choose what's going to unfold like can I hold both um it's like that same thing of like feeling five years out yeah and like like that same but like having to stay in year one even though that's five years away right like having being like looking at your finances right now and be like I know I'm gonna be like wealthy I'm gonna build this house and I couldn't I couldn't get approved for a house at all right yeah. now. And like, maybe I'll move in that direction and maybe that's what, you know, will occur. And I just have to keep following my knowing around that. And, um, oh, there's something else where, so I had a really good friend who we raised our kids together until Taylor was like seven or eight. And she basically called me one day and was like, I can't be friends with you anymore. Hmm. And like, we have not spoken since that day. And she got engaged to Yeah. And I, I think about her on a regular basis because like there was part of me, like I knew the whole time we were friends that it was a lot for her to be friends with me. Mm. And I kept trying, like, I see how unavailable I was, but I was giving her the best of what I, I really was giving her the best. And it was so shitty as a friend, mm. you know what I mean? Compared to like, she was just one of those people who like, was like pretty much like figured out life early and really did life like in a really healthy way <laughs> and like had a great husband and a really, you know what I mean? Like she just, like, I would go over there and be like, I wish Taylor had this life. I wish I had this life. Like yeah. I, I would live here and be your daughter. <laughs> like yeah. it was they, like, they have like a very big peace about them. Yeah. They're peaceful. They're just like really like the highest vision of family for me that I've seen to a certain extent and imperfect, but she would, they would feed us all the Mm -hmm. time. She would, she bought me these pink chairs. Like my, for a long time, I was working 70 hour weeks. My house, our house looked like, um, an empty apartment that no one lived in. Like I didn't, I didn't do anything in the house Mm -hmm. and she would bring it out, point it out all the time. And I just, I just wasn't available. And then when she would get mad at me, I couldn't hold it. Mm. I couldn't even see what she was pointing at. And like, that's my experience with Heyman. Mm. Like reversed? Yeah. And Mm. like, I know even at every stage of walking with Heyman on his healing journey, I have seen myself and experienced myself on the other side of, and I remember thinking like, I'm so committed to her. I would be friends with her for the rest of my life and keep showing up no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the main thing that Heyman always says to me is like, Mm -hmm. and I also know, like, if I look at the course of my life, I think part of my purpose in the world is to help bring reunion across lines of difference and help people see the other side. And a really um, consistent theme is I always have to see, get on both sides of every relational, every situation that I've experienced. And like right now, like loving him means like protecting myself. Mm -hmm. And creating more space and not have giving him so much access to who I am. And also like, like the, like, there's just this sobriety in like seeing myself mm. in him, you know? Um, like loving myself like at that stage in my life and knowing like you really did the best that you could, like you really had nothing else. It's like, no matter how hard you tried, you were not going to like be what she needed at that time. Like, I feel like I can be what she needs today. I'm really like hearing you on that. Like, I feel like you're talking to me because I have a lot of guilt for Holly for the same kind of stuff. Like, you know, like pretty much verbatim what you said. Like, it's really, I really struggled to forgive myself for that version of who I was then. 
Well, that's what we always talk about too. It's just like whatever you're averse to in the other person, whatever you love in the other person, the aversion attraction game, it's like that's all in here. And it's can we see it? And when you can see it and acknowledge it and accept it in yourself, it's so much easier to love and accept in somebody else. And it's that, I mean, one of the norms in the conscious races is find yourself and everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know how to say this, but like me staying committed to Heyman and letting even, and when I say committed, it's like not committed, you know, I'm committed to being in relationship in the way that is, you know, best for me and best for him in each moment. But it's like, I'm, it's being committed to me. Mm. Say that again. I, no, but I'm like by committing to him, I'm committing to me. Like I'm saying, like yeah, there's nothing in your history that you've ever done mm-hmm. that I would leave you mm-hmm. for. That I would be completely out of relationship mm-hmm. with you around. Um, and I think that so the word that keeps coming up for me around my purpose is like you know, because my purpose is really important to me. And I've done a lot of work around like writing it out. And, it's, you know, it's been really long at times, but like the, my per- my core purpose is reunion. It's like reunion with all the parts of me, supporting reunion in others and supporting the types of communities where we see that everyone is us. And that like the only way for us to truly integrate and heal and move forward is for us to see that and to stay in relationship to it and mm-hmm. to stay in community with it and, t- and keep showing up mm-hmm. and that wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. My pussy got really turned on by the word reunion. <laughs> I, it felt like, like, it feels like I'm in a reunion with myself right now. You know, like I'm in, like I'm re doing that with myself and I like felt like a big, Well, I think that we're moving, you know, I I think there's ages and time and one age was individuation Mm -hmm. and separation and industrialization and progress. And that was like a huge part of the evolution of humanity. Mm -hmm. I think that now that's actually not of service. And so we're evolving from separation to like deep interbeingness. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, what would be required? What's the bridge yeah. between separation and interbeingness? It's reunion. Mm-hmm. It's coming back together yeah. again yeah. and again and again. And like you said, like we record these podcasts so I can go back and listen to them. <laughs> like everybody's purpose is so unique. And so I'm saying this, Lauren, to the future you and the scared you and the, you know, when you listen to this again, it's like your purpose is different than other people's mm-hmm. and everybody's purpose is different but like if your purpose is reunion you are going to move through heartbreak over and over again mm-hmm. and I know it gets to be a lot and it doesn't feel like other people are as willing mm-hmm. it feels like a very lonely purpose because you're so socialized to separate to Mm -hmm. say no that's too much I can't have that I can't be with that Mm -hmm. when you're standing for like I think you can yeah and I think I can you know like that is like a really um and I I think and it and it people are adverse to seeing me go through it Mm -hmm. when they see the level of heartbreak Mm -hmm. that it that it creates in me and if, but if I think collectively of how much heartbreak we need to move through to get to a place where this planet and humanity survives, it is a whole hell of a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am one of those people that really struggles to see her heartbreak. Like it really, like it honestly like feels like in my, it's like the way I was like feeling you in that mm-hmm. moment earlier. Like that's what I feel every time she calls me crying. Like every single time. Yeah. And so like, I totally validate that people do that too, because I do that. Well, also it's like, it's like, we don't like, we look away maybe if we see someone homeless or we see Mm -hmm. like, what I'm starting to realize is the level of heartbreak I'm experiencing, even like when we've been doing these attunement things or Jacqueline feeling the heartbreak of your nervous system, Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like people, it is in people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just very few of us who've like gotten our body to a place that like it can move through the body. Yeah. And sometimes it feels like even outside of the situation with Haman or everything else, sometimes it feels like my body is transmuting the heartbreak of everyone I'm connected to. I talk to them about that a lot. Like I, like I get drained just from like, like when I surround myself with certain people or even just like the collective knowing, like when I walk outside in New York city, it's like, I come back exhausted, like earth shatteringly exhausted because it's like, I'm feeling and I'm moving through all this energy and all this pain of other people. And it's like, once you open yourself up to that, you become kind of porous, like to use your word that you were using yesterday, but it, it's like such a gift and it's also such a struggle in one. And I know, you know, Ben last night, he was like, you're so supportive. He's like, you're just like so supportive. And I was like, I was like, I hate that you, that that's the case. Like, I hate that this is not the norm for mm-hmm. you. Like to like, to be held in this way that we're not just in a norm of being held. And I think it's so hard that these people that are learning to hold or that we're coming online to hold like it's a lot. You yeah, are holding an in a disproportionate amount. Yeah, right it's a now. lot. I have the the visions and a lot of the intuition I is like when I get connected to somebody that I like has a lot of suffering and hasn't been held, I want to hold the fuck out of them. Like I literally want to hold them, feed them, bathe them, clothe them, surround them with things, love them, like affirm them. And I don't like I I I bump into just my own limits of what I can do as like one person with all these people that and I think I'm in a place right now of like like yesterday I was off I didn't I had one client (laughs) I talked to you guys on the phone FaceTime for a little bit I had one client I did not do shit otherwise and like I have an impulse to reach out to different people and you know get in touch with some different things and show up and I was I literally just laid around the whole day because I'm so tired and I'm like learning what is the right balance of like resourcing myself so that I can hold space for other people and help other people and love other people versus like mm-hmm. getting really carried away in a fantasy of like taking care of everybody in some way. That's like not even possible. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's not, not even wanted by the person. Oh, it's, I would say it's not even what they need. Like the versions of taking care that most of us learned mm-hmm. are not the kind of care we're talking about. And yeah. I think about Jacqueline's journey, like something important about Jacqueline's journey is Jacqueline was having very little emotions move through her body, but Bethany, it was like almost as if it it was so affirming to me to watch that because that's my experience constantly is like in group settings is like watching the discharge go the energy goes to the places. It's like, even if you were in electric wires or something, it's like, it's going to go to the wire Mm -hmm. that can carry the charge. And that's what I watched. I watched. I don't know what we're talking about right now. (laughs) Like in Jack, in Jackie's journey, Lauren and I sat with her for her journey with medicine, you know, with medicine work. Mm -hmm. And she was what she was saying. She was kind of going through all these different experiences and memories of her life around her whole sexual journey and in a friendly way for her system, which included like just the pictures and memories and not really feeling everything that came up when she was thinking about it and moving through it. Does that sound accurate? Does that match yeah. your experience? Mm-hmm. But I did. <laughs> I, I And I've been working with Jackie and getting to know her and we have a lot of similarities. And I've, so I was feeling it all like the, some of the pain, like when she was like even physical sensations of pain and things like that when she was talking about certain things or the emotions related to it. And I was making like very quick work of it. Like I was moving through it and letting it come through and letting it sort of like resolve. And I, that's the first time I've ever really done something like that. I didn't know that that was going to happen, but this is like going back to Mia, Mia, the manifester uh, episode, Lauren, where you're like, well, you're surrounding yourself with like people with, you know, powers. powers. So you're probably got some power. So, and I didn't really know how to I didn't know how to let that just come through. It kind of came in a little bit. And so I learned a ton, but yeah, you got to, I I was felt extremely attuned. Like I was actually a little ahead. even sometimes like I knew what was coming next and I've never been probably that attuned to someone for a period like that, you know? 
Well, and that's what she needed. And yeah. it wasn't the same as like, I'm going to make her dinner or yeah. I'm going to go, you know what I mean? Well, this happened yesterday when Lauren was laying in her bed. Like I was feeling like there were some heavy topics that came up and I was like sobbing. Like I like, it was like, I could feel the heartbreak of all the stuff that had happened in her bed. Mm-hmm. And I was just sobbing and it was like moving through my body and I felt it. Cause I, and I knew it wasn't mine. Like, it was like the first time that yeah. I was like online and I was like, this is not mine, but I will just allow this to just like, and, and, it's like, and, we, and I had the space for it in the moment that you didn't. And you right. just had the space for it in the moment that and I, I and we're like this in the moment that Lauren did it. And that's why relational, like can be committed and attuned. The relational feels so important because like no one of us can hold it all the time. Right. And that's why we get to be with each other in stuff. It's so, but these power dynamics and these places where people are completely cut off from their bodies. Like if we think about, that's what I'm feeling collectively. And even in relationship is like, like, let's just use like, as we often come back to this race metaphor, let's, let's just say as an extreme, and I know this is not completely true, Let's say that black bodies have stayed very awake to their emotional experience and their physical experience. And let's say that white bodies have generally totally shut down from that experience. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways in which collectively black bodies have carried and processed and transmuted things for whiteness that we've been unavailable for. And I see in that conversation, this like exhaustion, like I can't keep doing all of this Mm -hmm. for you. And there's a way that that's even showing up with like Haman and I, it's like, I can feel like, okay, you're ready now to take some of this back. I've been carrying it for you until you could. And now you, Mm -hmm. you have the things in place. So I'm energetically giving some of this Mm -hmm. back. Yeah. And, and I'm just saying like, that's how we create. Um, and then when you're the body that's awake and aware and the person's telling you either you're too sensitive or something's wrong with you, or as if what you're feeling is only yours mm-hmm. because they're such in denial of their own experience. And the fact that you're holding it for both of you, mm-hmm. like, that's the thing that I feel like And that's why also I'm very invested in MDMA for PTSD and like the support of trauma because of the amount of intergenerational trauma that we are trying to move through. It is hard for me to see how bodies, and I even say that for me, my body can hold what it can hold because of, um, I mean, a lot of healing, but very also specifically the trauma healing I've done on MDMA. Mm -hmm. Same. Well, and I also like, I really kind of connecting to what you were saying like you Lauren sent me this text right before I came like saying basically I'm gonna butcher it but like saying that she felt guilty for like the little sister having to come in and be the big sister and like take care of her and I kind of just like responded with something like like you know I'm not little anymore like and I really am available to hold the space for you now. Like I'm really like, it's like, I'm your, I'm the sister. I'm not, I don't need to be the little sister anymore. The one that like couldn't hold the space, you know? And so I've really felt that like, since I've been here, the first, I feel like this is the first time, like really that I've ever been able to just sit here and be like, like, what do you need? You know, type thing. And And like what a gift it is. Like um, Steve always says something like, there's no helpers and helped like she, she's served by getting to, you know, like we're all served by getting to support and help other people. It serves us. It's, it's, beautiful. Yeah. it's an amazing, like I told her it, it, it's the most amazing, most rewarding feeling to be needed Yeah. by your sister. And like, she's wanted that. And there's a way I can relate to that. And, and on my relationship with him and with other relationships where you can see that they won't let themselves depend on anyone else. Mm-hmm. And you, it's like, you love them so much and you just kind of want them to fall into you and know, like you're going to be held here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're just kind of like, yeah, this. 
and how good it feels when they're finally like they fall into you (laughs) because I want to love you like that I want you to receive my love and there's something really beautiful about about the ability to do that you know Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a story that you're doing something to her by her asking for her for her help, but actually, it's like a something she's longed for. Well, because mm-hmm. the energy is supposed to go like this, which I think is interesting. We have this big half circle. Mm-hmm. The energy is supposed to be like this. Yeah. But let's say like Jacqueline's blocked. Yeah. The energy goes. Phew, I'm blocked. It goes. Phew. And then usually when it goes over here. I see something I don't want to see. And I'm like, uh-uh, mm-hmm. nope. Yeah. No more relationship. I'm, got, I'm leaving a relationship. But it's supposed to be like, just this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, we've even had a history of, like, she's, that we've been working through where, you know, like, during the Greece thing, like, she really wasn't there. Yeah. Like, she wasn't there. I wasn't available. Like, I... I mean, really, when I look back now, like I ran as soon as I got out of that house where my parents lived, I went 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction because I had been holding all All of of it it for so long by myself. And I couldn't I just went and it was all unconscious. I just went on this unconscious like explosion Mm -hmm. from holding it all. And I couldn't even when my dad was dying, like I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I, I mean, I've had to really move through and accept, and I'm still getting to places of acceptance. Like I wasn't there for my sister and brother. I was not there for my mom. Like, and I was there for, like, you could talk to 300 families on the West side of Chicago that would say Miss Henley was down for us and did everything she could. You know what I mean? There's just I want to this. Say something that might can be kind of triggering, but like, that was my experience with dad. Yeah. Like he was there for every club kid. That was he my would, experience. He would show, like, my dad would show up for all the club kids. If they were in trouble, he'd be there. If they the needed something, club. the Boys, boys and Girls, and girls club. club. He was executive director of Boys and Girls Club. And, or just his friends, like. Like, he would be there 100% for them. But then, like, would not show up for any of my recitals. Or, or, like, or like, our emotional. Or emotional stuff. Like, seeing himself in us was too much for him. Mm-hmm. So he would push, and we would feel the push. Like, mm-hmm. I actually can't. When you, when I got pregnant, I can't see myself mm-hmm. when I do, 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 and like, even that's what I feel like I'm going through. I'm experiencing with Hitman right now. It's like how he's so connected to community and he's so passionate about being in the community and can give so, and much. Can give so much to them. And like over here, it's like, mostly I just reflect to him things that he doesn't want to see. That's like, phew, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why another thing that I've been, I I believe is true. I believe that one of the greatest things that we can do for humanity present and future is to get really committed to our most intimate relationships. And I mean, the ones that the universe gave you Mm -hmm. that you don't really like Mm -hmm. your family, your partner, your kids, and to be the very fucking best version of you there and to get all the learning Mm-hmm. and I just think it just expands from there you know that I had this conversation with a man who's been going back and forth about taking my class and is like struggling with shame about being a white man he's like I just don't know and I'm like honestly because I know him deeply I'm like the the most amazing thing that I see you doing is the work you're doing with your wife and the work that you're doing with your kids and like and you getting really, really available as a white man in your family, like start there. Mm-hmm. Well, and it kind of like, it's also like that connects to the knowing and the unknowing. Like I really know that I'm going to have a better relationship with my mom one day. Like I really know that. Like I do, like I deeply feel it in my bones that one day we're really just going to see each other, but I don't know how. <laughs> And I can't, I don't feel like I know how to do that now. And so I'm like in sitting and just not knowing what to do, you know? Mm-hmm. That's the other message the universe is giving me a lot. is like, you don't know how to heal your yeah. relationships. Yeah. You don't know what is needed. You don't know how to get in the right relationship. Your best effort. And it's not in this like demeaning way. It's just like, 
this is a really complex process that's mm-hmm. connected to a lot of things. Like this is something you have to surrender mm-hmm. and you keep trying to like figure it out and get really good at it. And you just have to fucking surrender. Um, and when I go back, like I have like my, my relationship with Taylor's dad, for example, like I feel like it's been like a miracle in my life to be from where it was to what it is now. Like I've had my mom, my relationship with my mom is a miracle from what it was to what it is now. And like, those weren't, you know, there are some, what I did was I showed up willing to heal the relationship. I showed up willing to be what I was called to be and to sometimes go first. Like that's what is like, feels like what's mine to do is like, just go first. Mm -hmm. But like with this relationship with him and like I, getting a right relationship with him, healing that, ha- finding some place where we can like have flow as whatever it is. Like, I don't have the skills. I need the universe to get in right relationship. I needed the universe to help me get in right relationship with Jacqueline. In some ways, I just kept showing up to the next thing. Yeah, I feel like I feel very connected to that with you and me. Like you're one of the only people that I like even unconsciously just like kept showing up no, like no matter how much I got hurt no matter like you weren't I it was never in my brain to like to leave you know what I mean like it was never a thought like I would have with friends or like <clears throat> relationships I'd be like okay this isn't flowing I'm gonna go yeah. but like with her or even like with my brother like we're not in a good place right now like I would never leave like I just it's not even in my brain I just continue to sit and show up and, you know trust it's medicine for me today why'd you roll your eyes I gotta pee really bad because I I've been telling myself that and like getting real sideways and you're just restating something like I'm saying that's my medicine today what you're saying like just keep showing up and see what happens and trust that it's going the way it's supposed to go like I I needed to hear that today well and it's really hard for us because we like take charge you know, like we like, I know. And, and we get, we've got a lot of good results from like, maybe yeah, it's like, it's, it's a gift. Yeah. So surrendering. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, the boys are going to get dropped off here any minute. Yeah. I know. I was about to say coming close on time. I mean, Jesse's never been on time, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't unlock the door so when they come I'll have to hop up and grab the door but <sighs> I'm so happy but that you're I hadn't asked you yet like how your pain has been over this last several weeks I'm happy to hear yeah I'm happy to hear the shit works <laughs> the last thing i want to say is i i was thinking about jesus which i don't think about a lot (laughs) but i'm like i feel like jesus really was about this and jesus could do it for maybe 12 people Mm -hmm. yeah and maybe and probably a few more that we just don't know about like his mom and mary magdalene and we don't know all the details but like that's some real truth to be like don't be trying to do this for more than 12 people like there's, yeah there's like really people. there are limitations and like to the for example like and i think there's safe place there's places to do it where you're not going to be called into the relational field so yeah. like these are dad as an example like if you keep going out to the places that project only your positive qualities back like you're not going to get into the like next layer of relational whatever which is what I think I did at Kip was like for a while it's like I just I, I wanted I went somewhere where I knew how to help people loved my help and I got reinforced about that and it really wasn't that relational it wasn't that intimate it wasn't reciprocal like in some ways I had the power because you know I think that hero energy right is like I have the power I'm not really being vulnerable and I can use this relationship to kind of avoid all the things I don't want to see about myself. And Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about what my theory is that we all have a constellation of people 
And even when you get rid of one part of the constellation, that person just shows up again in another form. And once you start to get really aware, like who's your constellation and you get really masterful with those relationships, my, my theory or my sense is the availability for life, love, creativity, expansion, mm-hmm. and interdependent healing just is exponential from there. And we really have, it's, it's so interesting to me. Like I see, like I think about Jacqueline as someone who would like throw herself into a fire. There's so many things. <laughs> no, there's so many things that you would do or just levels of discomfort that are physical yeah. that I would not. But what I see is like, as a culture, we are 500 times more willing to go through physical discomfort than the emotional deconstruction Mm -hmm. of a relational container. Like to your point with mom, like you get so far and you need a break and I'm not judging that you need a break, but it is that intolerable Mm -hmm. to us. But you might jump out of an airplane or you might. It's like it's just to watch these like dichotomies and to see that like like even, you know, when I coach people who are in white bodies, like all that's really being asked of you is a self deconstructive relational process. But the shame or the guilt or the things below that for so many white bodies is so deep Mm -hmm. that their body experiences that more like death than working 70 hour weeks with no break. Mm -hmm. And like, these are the things that I think as I step more into my confidence about what I know to be true or why I'm here, that I want to be able to keep speaking to and keep pointing to. And because I've walked through it, it's no fucking joke. Building your resilience. Like there was a time where Jacqueline called me She's like, I'm angry at you and I need to say a bunch of things. And she sent me this recording and it was like the most like evil, hated, like I fucking hate you. You're the most horrible person on the planet. And I, at that point, there'd been a lot of times she tried to communicate things like that, that I wasn't available and I was available for it. And the heartbreak of the fact that that was, that is true, that is in me, that she experienced that part of me, that that part of me had consequences for her and how much I love her. It, it, that level of shame to know your kid's heartbreak, to know you have participated in hurting your kids. And the thought I'm having right now is that like, that is what Heyman cannot fully tolerate in our relationship. It's like that he does love me enough that like when I reflect to him back to him, how much pain it's certain choices and decisions that have caused him. Like it is too much to face. Mm -hmm. And I think, I guess what's coming up now is like that part supporting people to move through that is probably like the next iteration of my journey but then I think about like I and I said this when we did that reenactment for your sister's thing was like the thought of what if I didn't have a relationship with my sister what if I hadn't chosen that yeah or like you know, and to a certain extent, that's what I'm having to face with my dad. I didn't choose that with him. And it didn't, it wasn't even really accessible because for 10 years he was just gone. Yeah. And there's just actually something that's like that that's the alternative is to not get to the place where you get to see what it was all for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a relationship like my sister, we will be together supporting each other till we die without question. You know, we have other life things like we know our mom is going to leave this earth before we do like, or, you know, actually I'd rather it be that way. We know there's things like that, like, like, and to your point, like life is hard and we're not meant to carry it alone. And what if life gave us the perfect constellation of support? Mm -hmm. And what's required of us is to move through our own like fragility of seeing the truth that they reflect back to us 
so that we can have the full support that was offered to us from the beginning. Well, and it's also this, like, I was thinking about our relationship on the flight here. Like, I am one of the only people in your life that will ever fully understand what you're talking about with dad. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm one, so I'm the things. only person that will, un- like, other than Ford. But, like, I, like, there's only, like, when it comes to family. Or like, that they're, you hold the same DNA. That yeah. You, there's so many things that, like. Like, it's just a fundamental truth that, like, we, like, I just, like, can't get my friends to grasp when I talk to them versus, like, when I tell you about it. So, like, the other side you're pointing to is there's a way you can see me that is so nourishing or so satisfying that I'm not going to get, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just kind of, like, for the rest of Taylor's life, very likely, no one's going to feel and make him feel the way his mom Mm -hmm. And like, what if like, we're all little puzzle pieces and like in our heart and like, I need a mom piece and I need a dad piece and I need a sister piece and I need a partner piece. Like, what if that's why in relationships, we just keep trying to date our moms and dads and we just repeat it over and over and over again, because there's a certain, there's like these certain qualities, aspects, like ways of being seen, ways of being held that we're all searching for that because this isn't how everyone's looking at doing life and showing up in life most of our parents like don't quite they didn't quite succeed for most of us so we're just still looking for that yeah and like what I'm pointing to what if it is right there Mm -hmm. like what if actually you know what if you have just like if you stay where you are like my dad is not here right now like on this plane I have been praying and asking for support from this other plane that he's in. I feel like he is showing up for that. And I feel like that there's these parts that, you know, maybe there's these other things that Heyman hasn't been available for, but over the last seven years, what did I need? I needed someone who was going to like stand by me and like be there for like every hard thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed. And that's what was there. Yeah. And like what I'm curious, I'm I'm more like my exploration now is really with like partnership and sex. And this is like a whole new kind of exploration for me. But <clears throat> but like I'm I'm really curious like if if we gave more space to some of those relationships, if if they're always being what we need them to be, and then they will evolve into the next thing. Um well just like the kind of that I I don't know if I want to end up, but like, you know, Lauren and I have asked for a lot of support from our dad from this other plane. And like the only thing, the only concepts that my dad, I felt like understood or tried to understand, he spent his life trying to understand was integrity. And like, he content, like he built a company called Integria Solutions. The only, every time he sat down to have a moral conversation, like he would use the word integrity like 10 times. And so the fact that this year is about this like realignment, this re like centering of who we are and what we want and what, like what is in true integrity with us to me can only be because he is showing up because to me, that's like the only thing he would know to like help us do, you know, in his way. And so like, I have a story that like this realignment of integrity for this year is our is our dad any last minute thoughts do you feel complete Jackie I think I just I don't know this doesn't have to be in the podcast but I just feel like I want to say this um I have a lot of fear about this episode because I have a story that there's a lot of people that don't like me who will be intrigued to hear me speak um I also make sure my private person you're not in my circle. Um, so like, I feel a lot of fear about this coming out, but it also feels good. And you know, if it does, when it does come out, all I just want to say is like, if you've been on my path, if you've been part of the collective healing that is Jacqueline Henley, like, thank you for the part that you played. And I'm sorry for anything that I did. And I just feel like I need to say that to everyone. I think it's a really beautiful space when you can get to the side of like feeling 
the grief of your impact. Yeah. And that's the side that I think that, I guess I'll say it in the positive. I believe that if more people got there, there would be so much less harm on the planet. Mm. You know, um, even like when I can sit outside and there's all this trash in the lake or trash floats up in my mom's bayou and I can just grieve like, and I'm not like, oh, look at these people trashing the earth. But I'm like, I have trashed the earth. Mm -hmm. I have been irresponsible. I have used a lot of plastic. Like I am part of the reason that I see this nasty, unhealthy mess floating in my beautiful, like this space that I think is so beautiful. You know, when I did my amends, like I, when I, when, especially if you sit in front of the person mm -hmm. and you feel like in the amends process in 12 step, you sit in front of them and you feel it. Mm. You don't do that shit again. Yeah. It, it's just, you just don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure there's like one or 2% that may, but at the end of the day, if you can be with someone and really see the harm that you caused, you won't do it again. Mm -hmm. And to be available for that, as we all, especially the three of us know, mm -hmm. to be available, to be able to hold yourself enough to, and heal your own shame enough to sit in front of another person, still be able to love yourself move your own emotions and also attune to their experience without running. Mm. Like, I don't, I don't know when people talk about enlightenment, I don't, what's beyond that. Yeah. And I just feel like anyone's name that I mentioned in this podcast today, like, I feel like right now, like this is my opportunity to like sit in front of them if they happen to pick this up. And I just like, like, I feel that, like, I feel just so sorry for the part that I played. Mm. But I also hope that the part that I played led to their own collective healing as well. And it was a mutual journey that we needed to go on. Hey, everybody, if you've got any feedback for us, we welcome it or ideas about future guests. Email us at healingcollectivepod at gmail.com. Our website is thehealingcollectivepodcast.com. We are at Healing Podcast on Twitter, and we are at Healing Collective Podcast on Instagram. Special thanks to Mondoc Creative, who edits all of our podcasts, and Two Tall Women Productions, who produce. Thank you. Thank you.